Chapter Two Of Mr. Ralph Nickleby and his establishments, and his undertakings, and of a great joint stock company of vast national importance. Mr. Ralph Nickleby was not, strictly speaking, what you would call a merchant. Neither was he a banker, nor an attorney, nor a special pleader, nor a notary. He was certainly not a tradesman, and still less could he lay any claim to the title of a professional gentleman, for it would have been impossible to mention any recognised profession to which he belonged. Nevertheless, as he lived in a spacious house in Golden Square, which, in addition to a brass plate upon the street door, had another brass plate two sizes and a half smaller upon the left-hand doorpost, surrounding a brass model of an infant's fist, grasping a fragment of a skewer, and displaying the word office, it was clear that Mr. Ralph Nickleby did, or pretended to do, business of some kind. And the fact, if it required any further circumstantial evidence, was abundantly demonstrated by the diurnal attendance, between the hours of half-past nine and five, of a sallow-faced man in rusty brown, who sat upon an uncommonly hard stool in a species of butler's pantry at the end of the passage, and always had a pen behind his ear when he answered the bell. Although a few members of the graver professions live about Golden Square, it is not exactly in anybody's way to or from anywhere. It is one of the squares that have been a quarter of the town that has gone down in the world, and taken to letting lodgings. Many of its first and second floors are let, furnished, to single gentlemen, and it takes boarders besides. It is a great resort of foreigners. The dark-complexioned men, who wear large rings and heavy watch-guards and bushy whiskers, and who congregate under the opera colonnade, and about the box-office in the season, between four and five in the afternoon, when they give away the orders, all live in Golden Square, or within a street of it. Two or three violins and a wind instrument from the opera band reside within its precincts. Its boarding-houses are musical, and the notes of pianos and harps float in the evening-time round the head of the mournful statue, the guardian genius of a little wilderness of shrubs, in the centre of the square. On a summer's night, windows are thrown open, and groups of swarthy moustached men are seen by the passer-by, lounging at the casements, and smoking fearfully. Sounds of gruff voices practising vocal music invade the evening silence, and the fumes of choice tobacco scent the air. There snuff and cigars, and German pipes and flutes, and violins and violoncellos, divide the supremacy between them. It is the region of song and smoke. Street bands are on their metal in Golden Square, and itinerant glee-singers quaver involuntarily as they raise their voices within its boundaries. This would not seem a spot very well adapted to the transaction of business, but Mr. Ralph Nickleby had lived there, notwithstanding, for many years, and uttered no complaint on that score. He knew nobody round about, and nobody knew him, although he enjoyed the reputation of being immensely rich. The tradesman held that he was a sort of lawyer, and the other neighbours opined that he was a kind of general agent, both of which guesses were as correct and definite as guesses about other people's affairs usually are, or need to be. Mr. Ralph Nickleby sat in his private office one morning, ready dressed to walk abroad. He wore a bottle-green spencer over a blue coat, a white waistcoat, grey mixture pantaloons, and Wellington boots drawn over them. The corner of a small plaited shirt-frill struggled out, as if insisting to show itself, from between his chin and the top button of his spencer. And the latter garment was not made low enough to conceal a long gold watch-chain, composed of a series of plain rings, which had its beginning at the handle of a gold repeater in Mr. Nickleby's pocket, and its termination in two little keys, one belonging to the watch itself, and the other to some patent padlock. He wore a sprinkling of powder upon his head, as if to make himself look benevolent, but if that were his purpose, he would perhaps have done better to powder his countenance also, for there was something in its very wrinkles, and in his cold restless eye, which seemed to tell of cunning that would announce itself in spite of him. However this might be, there he was, and as he was all alone, neither the powder, nor the wrinkles, nor the eyes, had the smallest effect, good or bad, upon anybody just then, and are consequently no business of ours just now. 
Mr. Nickleby closed an account-book which lay on his desk, and, throwing himself back in his chair, gazed with an air of abstraction through the dirty window. Some London houses have a melancholy little plot of ground behind them, usually fenced in by four high whitewashed walls, and frowned upon by stacks of chimneys, in which there withers on, from year to year, a crippled tree, that makes a show of putting forth a few leaves late in autumn, when other trees shed theirs, and, drooping in the effort, lingers on, all crackled and smoke-dried, till the following season, when it repeats the same process, and perhaps, if the weather be particularly genial, even tempts some rheumatic sparrow to chirrup in its branches. People sometimes call these dark yards gardens. It is not supposed that they were ever planted, but rather that they are pieces of unreclaimed land, with the withered vegetation of the original brick field. No man thinks of walking in this desolate place, or of turning it to any account. A few hampers, half a dozen broken bottles, and such like rubbish, may be thrown there when the tenant first moves in, but nothing more, and there they remain until he goes away again, the damp straw taking just as long to moulder as it thinks proper, and mingling with the scanty box, and stunted ever-browns, and broken flower-pots that are scattered mournfully about, a prey to blacks and dirt. It was into a place of this kind that Mr. Ralph Nickleby gazed, as he sat with his hands in his pockets, looking out of the window. He had fixed his eyes upon a distorted fir-tree, planted by some former tenant in a tub that had once been green, and left there years before, to rot away piecemeal. There was nothing very inviting in the object, but Mr. Nickleby was wrapped in a brown study and sat contemplating it with far greater attention than, in a more conscious mood, he would have deigned to bestow upon the rarest exotic. At length his eyes wandered to a little dirty window on the left, through which the face of the clerk was dimly visible. That worthy chancing to look up, he beckoned him to attend. In obedience to this summons, the clerk got off the high stool, to which he had communicated a high polish by countless gettings off and on, and presented himself in Mr. Nickleby's room. He was a tall man, of middle age, with two goggle eyes, whereof one was a fixture, a rubicund nose, a cadaverous face, and a suit of clothes, if the term be allowable when they suited him not at all, much the worse for wear, very much too small, and placed upon such a short allowance of buttons that it was marvellous how he contrived to keep them on. "'Why is that half-past twelve, Noggs? said Mr. Nickleby, in a sharp and grating voice. "'Not more than five and twenty minutes by the—' Noggs was going to add public-house clock, but, recollecting himself, substituted, "'Regular time.' "'My watch has stopped,' said Mr. Nickleby. "'I don't know from what cause.' "'Not wound up,' said Noggs. "'Yes, it is,' said Mr. Nickleby. "'Overwound, then,' rejoined Noggs. "'That can't very well be,' observed Mr. Nickleby. "'Must be,' said Noggs. "'Well,' said Mr. Nickleby, putting the repeater back in his pocket, "'perhaps it is.' Noggs gave a peculiar grunt, as was his custom, at the end of all disputes with his master, to imply that he, Noggs, triumphed, and as he rarely spoke to anybody unless somebody spoke to him, fell into a grim silence and rubbed his hands slowly over each other, cracking the joints of his fingers, and squeezing them into all possible distortions. The incessant performance of this routine on every occasion, and the communication of a fixed and rigid look to his unaffected eye, so as to make it uniform with the other, and to render it impossible for anybody to determine where or at what he was looking, were two among the numerous peculiarities of Mr. Noggs, which struck an inexperienced observer at first sight. "'I am going to the London Tavern this morning,' said Mr. Nickleby. "'Public meeting?' inquired Noggs. Mr. Nickleby nodded. "'I expect a letter from the solicitor respecting that mortgage of Ruddles. If it comes at all, it will be here by the two o'clock delivery. I shall leave the city about that time and walk to Charing Cross, on the left-hand side of the way. If there are any letters, come and meet me, and bring them with you.' Noggs nodded, and as he nodded there came a ring at the office bell. The master looked up from his papers, 
and the clerk calmly remained in a stationary position. "'The bell,' said Noggs, as though in explanation. "'At home?' "'Yes.' "'To anybody?' "'Yes.' "'To the tax-gatherer?' "'No.' "'Let him call again.' Noggs gave vent to his usual grunt, as much as to say, "'I thought so.' and the ring being repeated went to the door whence he presently returned ushering in by the name of mr bonny a pale gentleman in a violent hurry who with his hair standing up in great disorder all over his head and a very narrow white cravat tied loosely round his throat looked as if he had been knocked up in the night and had not dressed himself since my dear nickleby said the gentleman taking off a white hat which was so full of papers that it would scarcely stick upon his head "'There's not a moment to lose. I have a cab at the door. Sir Matthew Pupka takes the chair, and three members of Parliament are positively coming. I have seen two of them safely out of bed. The third, who was at Crockford's all night, has just gone home to put a clean shirt on, and take a bottle or two of soda water, and will certainly be with us in time to address the meeting. He is a little excited by last night, but never mind that. He always speaks the stronger for it.' "'It seems to promise pretty well.' said Mr. Ralph Nickleby, whose deliberate manner was strongly opposed to the vivacity of the other man of business. "'Pretty well,' echoed Mr. Bonney. "'It's the finest idea that was ever started. United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company. Capital, five millions, in five hundred thousand shares of ten pounds each. Why, the very name will get the shares up to a premium in ten days.' "'And when they are at a premium,' said Mr. Ralph Nickleby, smiling, "'When they are, you know what to do with them, as well as any man alive, and how to back quietly out at the right time,' said Mr. Bonney, slapping the capitalist familiarly on the shoulder. "'By the way, what a very remarkable man that clerk of yours is!' "'Yes, poor devil,' replied Ralph, drawing on his gloves, "'though Newman Noggs kept his horses and hounds once.' "'Aye, aye,' said the other carelessly. "'Yes,' continued Ralph, and not many years ago either but he squandered his money invested it anyhow borrowed at interest and in short made first a thorough fool of himself and then a beggar he took to drinking and had a touch of paralysis and then came here to borrow a pound as in his better days i had done business with him said mr bonney with a meaning look just so replied Ralph. I couldn't lend it, you know. Of course not. But, as I wanted a clerk just then to open the door and so forth, I took him out of charity, and he has remained with me ever since. He is a little mad, I think, said Mr. Nickleby, calling up a charitable look. But he is useful enough, poor creature, useful enough." The kind-hearted gentleman omitted to add that Newman Noggs, being utterly destitute, served him for rather less than the usual wages of a boy of thirteen, and likewise failed to mention, in his hasty chronicle, that his eccentric taciturnity rendered him an especially valuable person in a place where much business was done, of which it was desirable no mention should be made out of doors. The other gentleman was plainly impatient to be gone, however and as they hurried into the hackney cabriolet, immediately afterwards, perhaps Mr. Nickleby forgot to mention circumstances so unimportant. There was a great bustle in Bishopsgate Street within, as they drew up, and, it being a windy day, half a dozen men were tacking across the road under a press of paper, bearing gigantic announcements that a public meeting would be holden at one o'clock precisely, to take into consideration the propriety of petitioning Parliament in favour of the United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company, capital five millions, in five hundred thousand shares of ten pounds each, which sums were duly set forth in fat black figures of considerable size. Mr. Bonney elbowed his way briskly upstairs, receiving in his progress many low bows from the waiters who stood on the landings to show the way, and followed by Mr. Nickleby, dived into a suite of apartments behind the great public room, in the second of which was a business-looking table and several business-looking people. "'Here!' cried a gentleman, with a double chin, as Mr. Bonney presented himself. "'Chair, gentlemen, chair!' The newcomers were received with universal approbation, 
and Mr. Bonney bustled up to the top of the table, took off his hat, ran his fingers through his hair, and knocked a hackney-coachman's knock on the table with a little hammer, whereat several gentlemen cried, Here! and nodded slightly to each other, as much as to say what spirited conduct that was. Just at this moment a waiter, feverish with agitation, tore into the room, and throwing the door open with a crash, shouted, Sir Matthew Pupka! The committee stood up, and clapped their hands for joy. And while they were clapping them, in came Sir Matthew Pupka, attended by two live members of Parliament, one Irish and one Scotch, all smiling and bowing and looking so pleasant that it seemed a perfect marvel how any man could have the heart to vote against them. Sir Matthew Pupka especially, who had a little round head with a flaxen wig on the top of it, fell into such a paroxysm of bows that the wig threatened to be jerked off every instant. When these symptoms had in some degree subsided, the gentlemen, who were on speaking terms with Sir Matthew Pupka, or the two other members, crowded round them in three little groups, near one or other of which the gentlemen who were not on speaking terms with Sir Matthew Pupka, or the two other members, stood lingering and smiling and rubbing their hands, in the desperate hope of something turning up which might bring them into notice. All this time Sir Matthew Pupka, and the two other members, were relating to their separate circles what the intentions of government were, about taking up the bill. With a full account of what the government had said in a whisper the last time they dined with it, and how the government had been observed to wink when it said so, from which premises they were at no loss to draw the conclusion, that if the government had one object more at heart than another, that one object was the welfare and advantage of the United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company. Meanwhile, and pending the arrangement of the proceedings, and a fair division of the speechifying, the public in the large room were eyeing, by turns, the empty platform and the ladies in the music gallery. In these amusements the greater portion of them had been occupied for a couple of hours before and as the most agreeable diversions pall upon the taste on a too protracted enjoyment of them, the sterner spirits now began to hammer the floor with their boot-heels, and to express their dissatisfaction by various hoots and cries. These vocal exertions, emanating from the people who had been there longest, naturally proceeded from those who were nearest to the platform, and furthest from the policemen in attendance, who, having no great mind to fight their way through the crowd, but entertaining nevertheless a praiseworthy desire to do something to quell the disturbance, immediately began to drag forth, by the coat-tails and collars, all the quiet people near the door, at the same time dealing out various smart and tingling blows with their truncheons, after the manner of that ingenious actor, Mr. Punch, whose brilliant example, both in the fashion of his weapons and their use, this branch of the executive occasionally follows. Several very exciting skirmishes were in progress, when a loud shout attracted the attention even of the belligerents, and then there poured on to the platform, from a door at the side, a long line of gentlemen with their hats off, all looking behind them, and uttering vociferous cheers. The cause whereof was sufficiently explained when Sir Matthew Pupka, and the two other real members of Parliament, came to the front, amidst deafening shouts, and testified to each other in dumb motions that they had never seen such a glorious sight as that in the whole course of their public career. At length, and at last, the assembly left off shouting, but Sir Matthew Pupka being voted into the chair, they underwent a relapse, which lasted five minutes. This over, Sir Matthew Pupka went on to say what must be his feelings on that great occasion, and what must be that occasion in the eyes of the world, and what must be the intelligence of his fellow-countrymen before him, and what must be the wealth and respectability of his honourable friends behind him, and lastly, what must be the importance to the wealth, the happiness, the comfort, the liberty, the very existence of a free and great people, of such an institution as the United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company. Mr. Bonney then presented himself to move the first resolution and having run his right hand through his hair, and planted his left, in an easy manner, in his ribs, he consigned his hat to the care of the gentleman with the double chin, who acted as a species of bottle-holder to the orators generally, and said he would read to them the first resolution. That this meeting views with alarm and apprehension the existing state of the muffin trade in this metropolis, and its neighbourhood, that it considers the muffin-boys, as at present constituted, wholly undeserving the confidence of the public, 
and that it deems the whole muffin system alike prejudicial to the health and morals of the people, and subversive of the best interests of a great commercial and mercantile community. The Honourable Gentleman made a speech which drew tears from the eyes of the ladies, and awakened the liveliest emotions in every individual present. He had visited the houses of the poor in the various districts of London, and had found them destitute of the slightest vestige of a muffin, which there appeared too much reason to believe some of these indigent persons did not taste from year's end to year's end. He had found that among muffin-sellers there existed drunkenness, debauchery, and profligacy, which he attributed to the debasing nature of their employment as at present exercised. He had found the same vices among the poorer class of people who ought to be muffin consumers, and this he attributed to the despair engendered by their being placed beyond the reach of that nutritious article, which drove them to seek a false stimulant in intoxicating liquors. He would undertake to prove before a committee of the House of Commons that there existed a combination to keep up the price of muffins, and to give the bellman a monopoly. He would prove it by bellmen at the bar of that house, and he would also prove that these men corresponded with each other by secret words and signs as Snooks, Walker, Ferguson, Is Murphy Wright, and many others. It was this melancholy state of things that the company proposed to correct, firstly, by prohibiting, under heavy penalties, all private muffin trading of every description, secondly, by themselves supplying the public generally and the poor at their own homes with muffins of first quality at reduced prices. It was with this object that a bill had been introduced into Parliament by their patriotic chairman, Sir Matthew Pupka. It was this bill that they had met to support. It was the supporters of this bill who would confer undying brightness and splendour upon England, under the name of the United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company. He would add— with a capital of five millions, in five hundred thousand shares of ten pounds each. Mr. Ralph Nickleby seconded the resolution, and another gentleman having moved that it be amended by the insertion of the words, and crumpet, after the word muffin, whenever it occurred, it was carried triumphantly. Only one man in the crowd cried no, and he was promptly taken into custody, and straightway borne off. The second resolution— which recognised the expediency of immediately abolishing all muffin, or crumpet, sellers, all traders in muffins, or crumpets, of whatsoever description, whether male or female, boys or men, ringing handbells or otherwise, was moved by a grievous gentleman of semi-clerical appearance, who went at once into such deep pathetics that he knocked the first speaker clean out of the course in no time. You might have heard a pin fall. A pin? A feather! as he described the cruelties inflicted on muffin-boys by their masters, which he very wisely urged, were in themselves a sufficient reason for the establishment of that inestimable company. It seemed that the unhappy youths, when nightly turned out into the wet streets at the most inclement periods of the year, to wander about, in darkness and rain, or it might be hail or snow, for hours together, without shelter, food, or warmth— and let the public never forget upon the latter point that while the muffins were provided with warm clothing and blankets, the boys were wholly unprovided for and left to their own miserable resources. Shame! The honourable gentleman related one case of a muffin-boy who, having been exposed to this inhuman and barbarous system for no less than five years, at length fell a victim to a cold in the head, beneath which he gradually sunk until he fell into a perspiration— and recovered. This he could vouch for, on his own authority, but he had heard, and he had no reason to doubt the fact, of a still more heart-rending and appalling circumstance. He had heard of the case of an orphan muffin-boy, who, having been run over by a hackney carriage, had been removed to the hospital, had undergone the amputation of his leg below the knee, and was now actually pursuing his occupation on crutches. Fountain of Justice! were these things to last. This was the department of the subject that took the meeting, and this was the style of speaking to enlist their sympathies. The men shouted, the ladies wept into their pocket-handkerchiefs till they were moist, and waved them till they were dry, 
The excitement was tremendous, and Mr. Nickleby whispered his friend that the shares were thenceforth at a premium of five and twenty per cent. The resolution was, of course, carried with loud acclamations, every man holding up both hands in favour of it, as he would in his enthusiasm have held up both legs also, if he could have conveniently accomplished it. This done, the draft of the proposed petition was read at length, and the petition said, as all petitions do say, that the petitioners were very humble, and the petitioned very honourable, and the object very virtuous. Therefore, said the petition, the bill ought to be passed into a law at once, to the everlasting honour and glory of that most honourable and glorious commons of England in Parliament assembled. Then the gentleman who had been at Crockford's all night, and who looked something the worse about the eyes in consequence, came forward to tell his fellow-countrymen what a speech he meant to make in favour of that petition, whenever it should be presented, and how desperately he meant to taunt the Parliament if they rejected the bill and to inform them also that he regretted his honourable friends had not inserted a clause rendering the purchase of muffins and crumpets compulsory upon all classes of the community which he opposing all half-measures and preferring to go the extreme animal pledged himself to propose and divide upon in committee after announcing this determination the honourable gentleman grew jocular and as patent boots lemon-coloured kit-gloves, and a fur-coat collar assist jokes materially, there was immense laughter, and much cheering, and moreover such a brilliant display of ladies' pocket-handkerchiefs as threw the grievous gentleman quite into the shade. And when the petition had been read, and was about to be adopted, there came forth the Irish member, who was a young gentleman of ardent temperament, with such a speech as only an Irish member can make breathing the true soul and spirit of poetry, and poured forth with such fervour that it made one warm to look at him. In the course whereof he told them how he would demand the extension of that great boon to his native country, how he would claim for her equal rights in the muffin laws as in all other laws, and how he hoped to see the day when crumpets should be toasted in her lowly cabins and muffin bells should ring in her rich green valleys and after him came the scotch member with various pleasant allusions to the probable amount of profits which increased the good humour that the poetry had awakened and all the speeches put together did exactly what they were intended to do and established in the hearers minds that there was no speculation so promising or at the same time so praiseworthy as the united metropolitan improved hot muffin and crumpet baking and punctual delivery company so the petition in favour of the bill was agreed upon, and the meeting adjourned with acclamations, and Mr. Nickleby and the other directors went to the office to lunch, as they did every day at half-past one o'clock, and to remunerate themselves for which trouble, as the company was yet in its infancy, they only charged three guineas each man for every such attendance. End of chapter 2